Hey everyone, this is Elijah Johnson with financeandliberty.com and back with us today is Dr. Jim Willie, editor of the Hattrick Letter found on goldenjackass.com. Jim, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, it's a pleasure being back. I think it's been about a month and uh, as usual, we have more significant events and what I can actually describe now as, as the billboard marquee message is that the breakdown of the global financial system is in progress and unstoppable to remove the dollar from its global reserve status among the banking centers of the world, banking systems of the world, and reimpose gold as the rule. And I think it's going to come in the form of gold for trade, followed by gold and currencies in the banking system. So we've got some unstoppable processes here underway, Elijah, and, and it's it's full of intrigue, but we're way past the point where the United States leaders, whether they're in Washington or in Wall Street, we're way past the point where they can interrupt or halt any of the developments going on. We, we now have uh, significant mo- momentum for removing the dollar and putting gold in its place. And I believe the Chinese RMB is going to act as an intermediary vehicle between the dollar and gold. So we'll have gold and, I'm sorry, we'll have dollar and and RMB, you know, renminbi, Chinese yuan. We'll have dollar and and RMB rule the day for trade settlement uh, as interim. And then we'll go to gold trade notes and then later we'll, we'll go to a, a more formal gold system in the banks with gold trade notes for letters of credit, etc. We're, we're way past the point here now where the dollar even has a chance to survive. We're, we're way past that. Well, one of the things that you said um, in a recent article that's going on right now is that the U.S. Fed is actually using Belgium, Luxembourg, Ireland, the Cayman Islands, and Switzerland to export QE. And it was kind of funny you called these the BLICS nations in contrast to the BRICS nations. Did you want to discuss the role of these BLICS nations, as you call them? And also, you talked about how the Fed is using them to export probably over a trillion dollars of QE per quarter. Did you want to discuss a little bit about this? I said way back in 2000 and. 12 when they began QE that it would go on forever. I called it QE to infinity when they announced QE2 and and when the uh, the taper talk taper talk occurred in in 2013 in other words cutting back on the QE volume I call that a bunch of nonsense a bunch of lies and and a trial balloon. <clears throat> well that failed so it was pretty clear that uh, QE to infinity was the rule. Now what we've got is QE being exported. Uh, these are secondary nations. Belgium is, is the home of some of the Euro Central Bank offices, but it's also the main center for European Union. Uh, they've, they've got a clearinghouse there, a gigantic one for, for European trade, uh, financial you know, clearing. And uh, it's where the European Union Parliament is. Luxembourg has always been a, uh, a financial center in Europe. It's kind of like a, an offshore interior nation to Europe. Uh, Ireland is a bit of a surprise. Cayman Islands is, is not a surprise. That's basically the Bank of England. Um, they use a number of nations in the Caribbean on a regular basis to hide their treasury bond purchases, namely Bermuda, Bahamas, and Cayman and Switzerland is the, the largest of these nations. So you've got the BLICs, and they have significant volume for their treasury purchases. Uh, since June of 2011, half that year, all of 12, all 13, all of 14, that's three and a half years, these, Blick, pardon me, these BLICs nations have purchased $818 billion worth of treasury bonds. It almost matches what the Fed has purchased or what they admit to purchasing. That doesn't count what Wall Street purchases as part of their carry trade. They're not in the business of uh, 
really investing in capital formation for U.S. businesses anymore. They're in the business of running carry trades, of borrowing free money and buying treasury bonds and putting leverage on it and uh, with the futures and, and making a lot of money without doing any work. Uh, and, and with a wink and a nod that rates will not ever rise so that the, bar, the borrowed money never backfires on them. So we've got enormous volume. Uh, and at the same time, as we have these hidden channels where basically the Fed has exported QE. What they're trying to do, Eli, they're trying to, they're trying to have the entire uh, system, the, the Western financial system, they're trying to get it to endorse and integrate QE. So it's not just the Fed. It's the top layer of the Fed, Bank of England, Euro Central Bank, and the Bank of Japan. Okay, so that's the top layer. Now we've got a secondary layer that's engaged in a tremendous amount of treasury bond purchases, and they are the BLICs. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if uh, they co their coverage of damage. I mean, this is a Wall Street backdoor bailout covering the Wall Street toxic portfolio. They run the U.S. government. Their master is the Fed, so their master is covering their minion Wall Street Bank portfolios with, for their toxic treasury bonds. But I wouldn't be at all surprised, given that we had a dismantling of the petrodollar, uh, all those derivatives. And, and, you know, people get confused a little bit by derivative. What's a petrodollar derivative? Well, it's a contract, a futures contract, exotic contract, all kind of different types of contracts that link the major currencies, the forex currencies, like the dollar, the euro, the pound, the Swiss franc, etc., that linked them to the crude oil price. Well, it's all being dismantled. That's why the crude oil price went down. The dismantling of the petrodollar system. And I don't believe for a minute that J.P. Morgan only lost $8 billion with the London whale back in May of 2012. I think it's much more like like over $100 billion, And that's why some of the dead bankers are from the Morgan Stanley offices. They're bankers who wanted to come forward. So instead of coming forward, they went for flying lessons without any kind of equipment. And they splattered not only on sidewalks, they splattered on, say, the fifth floor roof pavilion of a conference center or whatever. And the dead body didn't have to be cleaned up so quickly because it's on the fifth floor roof. So I, I believe we've got maybe as much as... 200 billion, 300 billion dollars a month being covered by the Fed and, and all of their extensions, the first layer of those major central banks and the BLICs. So that's what I think is going on. This is now a new phase where we're, we're not caught in QE to infinity. We're caught in QE to infinity being exported and integrated globally. All right, so I wanted to discuss now about the U.S. Treasury bond market. You recently discussed in an article that um, the U.S. Treasury bond market is actually at extremely low volume right now. What do you see lies ahead for the U.S. Treasury bonds? Yes, uh, it's interesting that the Treasury bond market is really undergoing seizures, and the symptoms are numerous. They, they come in a, a few rather marked ways right now. But the first thing that comes out and, and strikes any observer who's an expert in any way, shape, or form in the bond market is that the, the volume is way down. I, I've read reports that the volume compared to, say, two years ago. And two years ago, we were, you know, in, in QE also. It was, that was QE2 and Operation Twist ending and QE2 coming into place and uh, or the other way around and and QE3 being planned. Anyway, we were deep into QE uh, two years ago, but the volume is down something like 50 or 60 percent. And and the indications we're hear, hearing from various bond analysts and bank analysts is that the the system is more sensitive now. If there's a bunch of selling the movement's bigger. The volatility is mo for movement is, is bigger. So the, the whole system is, is more sensitive to shocks. 
because of the lower volume and, and the boast that you've heard for an entire generation that the treasury bond market is the largest and most liquid in the world. That ain't true anymore. Not at all. But here's some of the weird indications and symptoms that something's very wrong. We have negative interest rates. What the heck is that all about? Well, I'll give you a couple of indications. I, I like looking at things from a macro point of view. And, and my macro view is different from uh, a, a lot of different analysts out there. But QE it has destroyed capital. By printing money and not sterilizing, which means removing money elsewhere, by just printing money and infusing it into the system and bailing out the Wall Street banks with this backdoor purchases of, of their toxic bonds and putting it on the Fed balance sheet, it causes a reaction in the world. And the, the reaction is, is kind of simple. They, they, the big players look to hedge by buying hard assets as protection. Well, if, if all this money is being ruined, let's find something real. And the real things are like, you know, energy deposits, metal mines, and property buildings, commercial properties, gold and silver, artworks, uh, pleasure cruises. Who knows? So <clears throat> the liquidity is down. The negative interest rates have come into play, I think, because... So much capital is being ruined that the money from ruined businesses is trying to find safety because there are so few business opportunities out there. There's no recapitalization. The whole capital formation process is being, it's really messed up. So, you know, when you talk, when you hear the clown in the White House talking about, let's make new jobs, let's create jobs, let's create jobs. He has no idea how to create jobs. He's a Marxist. He has no idea what capital formation is. He doesn't like capital. He likes to tap capital. He likes to bleed capital. So the money seeks a haven and it goes into the banks and the banks don't want it. So they're trying to discourage the flow of money into the banks, and you see the negative interest rates. There are two really big important uh, features uh, in the bond market that are upside down. One is called the reverse repo. And, and first of all, here's what a repo is. It, it's, it's repurchase. Um, suppose you're a big company and you need, you need uh, $800 million dollars but you need it in cash, you've got the collateral, and you only need it for a week, maybe 10 days, $800 million. So you post your collateral, you've got some of these wonderful U.S. Treasury bonds that are considered pristine, AAA, and you post them and you get your cash, $800 million, and several days later, maybe even early, you give the money back, you pay it back, so you've got a repurchase of your assets. Well, the whole Reverse repo has gone upside down with some, they're touching on negative rates. There's another one called the dollar swap rate, and it too is in trouble. Okay, imagine you're, say, a, a French bank or a Spanish bank or a Liechtenstein bank in Europe, and, and you've got a big redemption of something, and you need, as a bank, to come up with a whole raft of dollars to redeem some guy at a window who's just cashing out something or other, a financial instrument. Well, that French bank or other European bank will tap the dollar swap facility. And it's basically uh, an endless credit line for banks run by the Fed out of New York and Washington. So that dollar swap rate is also touching on negative so things are upside down. I mean, we, we talk about the stimulus of QE, and it, it is just the opposite. It is a strangle on the economy, and you're seeing the, the, the distress with negative rates, reverse repo touching negative, and dollar swap touching negative. You know, we're also seeing some bizarre legal attempts and maneuvers, initiatives, call it what you want, toward a cashless society. Why would they do that? 
because it's the ultimate in capital controls. They're trying to prevent money from leaving the U.S. system. I have lots of clients who tell me, Jim, I couldn't believe it. I I wanted to remove $5,000 from my bank account the other day, and they told me, no, you can only do $2,000, and you've got a weekly limit of X and whatever. But they're trying to strangle people from leaving the system, removing money. So it's, it's bizarre. They've got a negative rate to discourage the movement of money in, and then they've got obstacles to re- prevent the individuals at the street level from removing money. So this is totally upside down. We're going to see really large-scale uh, U.S. Treasury bond dumping in future months. And you're seeing it in a lot of different ways. They call it indirect exchange. But like, like take, for instance, uh, China purchasing oh, just millions of tons of crude oil. Well, they're, they're not using dollars anymore. They're, they're using RMB to settle with Russia. And in the process, they're, they're making some big investments for the, the pipelines, extensions into the western provinces of China. And, and those investments are being done with U.S. Treasury bonds. So the, the, they call it indirect exchange. It's party A pays party B in our money, the dollar-based bond, the treasury bond. So this is very interesting stuff going on, seizures in the bond market. I'm just amazed the primary bond dealers that work directly with Wall Street and the Fed and the U.S. government, I'm amazed that so many bond dealers are still alive. I mean, these are the conditions that would kill them. Now, speaking of China, you also talked about in your article that the Chinese actually, you think, have taken control of the International Monetary Fund and not just to shut it down, but also to exploit it as a warehouse distribution center and primary model. So what do you think their agenda is and how will they use the IMF? Like a nice insertion, or a location to send a Trojan horse. It's kind of like a combination between a Trojan horse. I love my, my metaphors and images. Um, a combination of a Trojan, Trojan horse and Johnny Appleseed. Okay, they, they, the IMF, to begin with, is basically a broken office. The U.S. hasn't funded it for its share in over two years. The Chinese did a little over a year ago, I believe, in order to control it. And, you know, you, you could say, well, they, they control it so they could shut it down. Well, I thought that for a while, and now I'm starting to change my, my opinion. Sure, they'd like to shut it down, but they want to take control of it during a transition period. Uh, why shut it down when they can use it? It's useful. Why shut down the IMF when they can get the IMF to adopt a fifth currency in their special drawing rights, the SDR basket, adopt the Chinese yuan, the RMB. I, they're interchangeable. They're not two different currencies. The RMB stands for renminbi, and that's Chinese for uh, people's money. So people's money is the Chinese yuan, RMB. So they, they influence the, the IMF. I think they give them the marching orders now. I think the IMF gets phone calls from Beijing as to what to do next. It's like the IMF is caught in the middle. They're they're not going to be buried and plowed under and and just become rubble instead of an old office. They're going to be a a staging ground. Think think Trojan horse for having China enter the room with its RMB. That's the horse. And here comes the Johnny Appleseed seeding process. If the SDR basket, which is the dollar, euro, pound, and yen, adopts the RMB, that means that any new big infusions, like, say, another, (laughs) it's hard to say without laughing, another loan to Kiev, Ukraine, Bear in mind that 95% of the last tranche of $3 billion was stolen 
<laughs> you know, Kiev is nothing more than just a window for slush funds going to the elite oligarchs and control and, and you know, other armaments purchases, backdoor payments. That's what the IMF loan to Kiev is all about. But if there's a big grant, let's say there's something more legitimate, like Bangladesh gets a billion dollar bridge loan for a year, Bangladesh. Well, how does the billion dollars come? Well, you have the different five different currencies now. You have the dollar, the euro, the pound, and the yen. And they, they put money in by inserting according to the weights uh, it's not 20% across five it's it's a little it's it's not like that it's I don't know exactly what it is it, it used to be I think uh, 51% dollar and and the other three were not quite equally proportioned but you get the idea it, it's you know like like 20% 20% 10% and the dollars 50 well, now the, the, the yuan is going to be in there. The RMB is going to be in there. So if there's a new tranche of IMF money, then it's going to come in the form of the five currencies, including RMB. Now, that, how is that a Johnny Appleseed image? Well, it's really kind of simple. Nations around the world, just take, for instance, say, Korea. I like Korea as an example because it's it, it's not the biggest country in Asia, but it's a powerhouse. It has a strong economy, has a lot of exports, and has reserve savings accounts. Anytime you hear the word reserves, think saving account. So Korea notices that the IMF includes the Chinese RMB. And they say, well, gee, if that's the case then it's now a legitimate reserve currency. That's the key. The RMB is now going to be regarded as a legitimate reserve currency. And that means the banks of the world, like Korea, South Korea, are going to say, we need to add more RMB bonds in our savings account, which is their banking reserves foundation. So we're going to see the nations of the world add their Chinese government bonds. Well, if they're adding, aren't they then removing something? Yeah, the treasury bonds. The dollar's going to be pushed out from this seeding process as the Chinese Johnny Appleseed starts spreading their government bonds around the world in particular starting in Asia but Asia is key because Asia is where most of the emerging market nations are you know the at least the eastern hemisphere so that's the Trojan horse and the John, Johnny Appleseed um, there are going to be many kinds of RMB bonds and, and that's, that's a, I think a a pretty important point. Um, it's not just going to be Chinese government bonds, but this this endorsement by the IMF, Eli, is, is really an open door for nations like even England, Great Britain, United Kingdom, to issue UK gilts, which are their version of treasury bonds, their sovereign bond from the United Kingdom. The UK gilts are going to be issued increasingly, you know, starting out with moderate volume. They're going to be RMB based. So, and that has advantages for, for currency hedging. If you're a British wealthy person and you want to buy some Chinese government bonds, well, you can go ahead and do so, but you could also buy some British bonds soon that have RMB denominations and you don't have a, a currency risk for say the British pound going down versus other major currencies like the RMB. So we're going to see this seeding process take place across the banking systems, but it's going to affect the new bond issuance as well, not just old bonds shifting around with portfolio uh, alterations, they call it diversification, reallocation, but uh, big changes are coming. 
And, and this IMF situation opens the door in a very big way. So you can see, based on these justifications, these reasons, these open doors that I'm describing, you can see that it's useful for China not to shut down the IMF. Use it. They're going to exploit it. They're going to play it like a fiddle. And, and I was taken off guard. I thought China was going to shut it down and, and go with the New Development Bank and the Asian Inf Infrastructure Investment Bank, that AIIB now. The acronym is going to become more well-known. It's already becoming more used. But I thought they were going to shut down the IMF and say, you know, screw you guys. Get out of town. Close your offices. Lagarde, go get a job. No, this is uh, it, this is really an, an end game maneuver by China and very cleverly done. Now, I wanted to discuss a little bit more about what could accelerate this dumping of treasuries. Now, you've talked about before about how the Eastern banking system will not uh, accumulate more U.S. treasury bonds and also how uh, they will convert these U.S. Treasury bonds into gold bullion. Did you want to explain a little bit about this? And do you see other countries doing this as well? I think it's going to become a wildfire new movement across the world. There, the nations of the world, I, I love using the South Korean example. They're a strong nation, strong economy, big exporter. I mean, in Costa Rica here, you've got LG for electronics, you've got Hyundai cars. Over 90% of the taxis in San Jose, Costa Rica are Hyundai. And, and then you've got Samsung, you know, the Galaxy smartphone. So you, you've got major brand names of Korea all over the place in export. They're not going to be alone. India, Brazil... They're all going to follow the same, the same rule. They've been alerted starting in 2012. We call it stimulus. QE is only stimulus to the criminals on Wall Street. To the rest, it's a death sentence. It kills the U.S. economy. And it is threatening the entire global economy. Here's a reaction from nations like Korea. Well, gee, the U.S. Fed, Federal Reserve, with the management of the dollar, they're printing money. They're not sterilizing it. They're not removing money elsewhere. And they're buying treasury bonds. But we're holding treasury bonds. So you've got this African monetary policy they call QE. They're printing money undermining our savings account. No nation wants that. So every nation has been put on alert since 2012. Find a better way to store your savings. And there has been no better way until the last year or so when it's becoming quite clear that the Chinese RMB with its bonds might be a more secure place to stuff your savings and on top of that, you can use the RMB bonds on an increasing basis to pay your bills for imports and exports. So it's going to be, I think, a three-step process with these, these powerhouse banks across the world, the second-tier powerhouse banks that include nations like Norway, Brazil, uh, Lots and lots of countries have treasury bond accounts. They're going to start inserting the RMB bonds in step one. And if they don't have new savings, or they have, say, by surpluses, you know, export surplus, if they don't have new savings from surplus, and they buy more bond, RMB bonds than their surplus, they're going to have to remove something from their savings accounts, their reserves in the system. They're going to start removing treasury bonds. So the second step will be to remove treasury bonds, redeem them, cash them out, let them mature, not replace them. Like if they're holding a bunch of two-year bonds they had for two years, okay, they mature. You don't have to replace them. You can just let them mature, take your cash, and buy RMB bonds. And they can also buy, you know, 
British government bonds in RMB. I think we're going to start seeing before long Spanish and Italian government bonds in RMB denomination. Yeah, Italy issuing bonds to cover their deficits, not in euros, but in Chinese currency. That's what I think is going to come. Then comes the third step. They're going to, these nations of the world, like Korea, South Korea, they're going to conclude we don't need these treasury bonds anymore. We can start dumping them. And worse, if we're the last ones to dump them, we're going to get the least amount of money in the conversion from them. So they're going to start converting their treasury bonds to gold bullion. So watch RMB being inserted into the secondary nations of the world, and there are lots of, there are 30 of them, and collectively they're large. Individually they're small. Add them all up together, they're huge. They're a very important factor. And China is going to lead the way. China is going to start announcing their conversion of treasury bonds, and it's going to start a parade. They're going to convert them into gold. For all these years since QE began in 2012, their reserves, reserve accounts, the Korean reserves, have been endangered, put at risk by QE. Since when does that stimulate their reserves account? No, it undermines their reserves account. So in come the RMB, out go the treasury bonds, and soon there's going to be a, a large-scale movement to convert treasury bonds, primarily treasury bonds, among the sovereign bonds of the Western world. And, and believe me, we're going to see a lot of euro bonds also converted. We're going to see a lot of British bonds, the UK gilts, converted. We're going to see a lot of Japanese government bonds, the JGBs. They'll be converted. To be converted into metal, these four major sovereign bonds make up the great majority, like, like 98 or 99 percent of foreign reserves, their bank accounts, their savings accounts, national savings accounts. They don't want to lose them. And, and with the, the euro being printed willy-nilly by Prince Draghi at the Euro Central Bank and, and the British cooperating with the Fed with all kinds of dollar swap nonsense and activity, it's pretty clear to Korea that none of their sovereign bonds in their reserve systems are safe. So China's going to lead the way and we're going to see a lot of nations, like 50 nations, start using, for instance, the new fund that was just announced a week ago in Shanghai where it's pretty blatant, their language, in, in the Xinhua, that's X-I-N-H-U-A, Xinhua Net. It's kind of a mouthpiece for the Chinese government used for economic and financial news stories. They were very vocal. They said the time has come to end the, the financial tyranny by the dollar, to end the wars to defend the dollar, to end the fraud done by Wall Street, to end the counterfeit that the Americans have done in order to pay for their imports. So it was an invitation to 50 nations in Shanghai expressed by the Xinhua Net to come one, come all, bring your sovereign bonds and convert them to gold. So not only is there going to be a parade, there's already a pathway been created. Eli, this is going to be a gigantic story by the end of the year and next year when when I expect the climax to take place. Uh, the voice has been increasingly vocal in the last few weeks. He said, we're, we're going to see 2015 show a, a marked increase in breakdown events where it becomes extremely clear to even the most dull observer that the system has to be replaced, revamped, reformed, and reconstructed, and that's going to take place starting in early 2016. So you're not going to see a tremendous amount of momentum toward reconstruction until it's quite clear in the consensus that the current system is broken. And I just explained how the Treasury bond is broken. That's a foundation for the dollar. Negative rates, 
touching negative on reverse repo, touching negative on dollar swap, movements politically for cashless society. Okay, the system is breaking. The system has been insolvent for a long time. The big Western banks have been insolvent ever since Lehman. So they're running around in insolvency, and, and the big banks are not credit engines. They're not capital formation devices, enablers. So, Eli, this is all, it's all breaking down. It's, it's, it's ugly, and I'm, I'm looking forward to the, uh, the three-step of insert RMB, remove treasure bonds, and then convert all the sovereign bonds to gold bullion. But don't ever leave out the little brother, the shiny little brother silver. Uh, be assured that the new system coming in into, into view, into place, and, and into implementation will be gold and silver backed. The Voice made a comment last month that it, it was just unequivocal. He said, I don't guess, I don't hope, I know. The new BRICS currency system to support the new trade system for the Eurasian trade zone and elsewhere is going to be gold and silver backed. They will be both backing the monetary system. They're two monetary metals. And I like to think of it as gold being the macro and silver being the micro. Uh, gold is, is the, uh, does the heavy lifting like nation to nation account settling and silver does the, the transacting at, at the street level, the commercial level. Uh, that's a rough description, but that's my view of it, Eli. So mentioning this, did you want to expand a little bit about what role silver will play in the new monetary system? Yeah, as I said, we're, we're going to have the bimetallic system. And that has served well. If you look at history, you'll, you'll see the major nations of the world that had a gold standard also used silver. And some went entirely to silver. There was a there was a time, I think it was maybe around uh, 1000 BC, where the entire Greek system of currency was based on silver. It was largely because they had an enormous silver mine that they discovered, and it, it, it supported a century. So silver is important. You, you look back at the, the gold rush in the United States in the, the late 19th century, which is the origin of the, the word 49ers, like the San Francisco 49er football team. That's from 1849 gold rush, the Sierra Nevada, the Klondike, all that. Silver was a big part. They had a, I think it was a 16 to 1 legal ratio imposed by the Congress at the time uh, between gold and silver, 16 to 1 ratio. So silver is going to be important. Uh, I think the BRICS are going to have, I'm, I'm not thinking, I'm, I am told, I am informed by the voice, and I believe he's a consultant and a, uh, an expert analyst working toward implementation of the BRICS plan. And that's one reason he's been a little bit quiet on the topic with some key dropped hints and a key definitive quote to, to lead me in the right direction without divulging too much that would be in violation of his, of his own contracts of, of non-disclosure by paid consultants. But uh, look in the future for an array of currencies to come about. It's not just going to be the BRICS currency. I'm not even sure what the BRICS currency is going to look like. It might instead be a an array of currencies like the gold-backed yuan, the RMB, a gold-backed ruble from Russia, a gold-backed Nordic euro from Central Europe led by the Germans. There could be more. There, there could be a uh, Gulf dinar for the Persian Gulf nations. They, they prefer calling themselves the Gulf Emirates, Gulf nations. There could be a silver-backed currency in Mexico. We could see the Australians adopt a new currency. they got plenty of gold in their mining ventures there, but they might also tag along and just follow whatever China does because, let's face it, Australia is becoming very much so a Chinese colony. And I left out one nation in particular, the United States. We're going to come up with a gold currency, and it's going to be fraudulent. We're going to come up with a fraudulent gold-backed dollar I don't know exactly what the new name is going to be. I call it the Scheiss dollar, which is German for rubbish or shit. 
I think the Scheiss dollar is going to be challenged because some of the requirements for the array of BRICS currencies with precious metal backing is that they must sustain and satisfy independent audits. The U.S. dollar, the new dollar, gold back, is going to be fraudulent because it, too, will have this deep storage gold fraud. There is no gold. It's called deep storage gold because it's in the Nevada, Colorado, and Rocky Mountain hills. It's not gold. It's, it's a mountain. It's a bunch of dirt with gold in it. Uh, that's the U.S. gold backing, and they're going to be called on it, and it's going to have some controversy. I expect the controversy is going to happen in 2016 and 17 during challenges, and we're going to see heavy devaluation of the new dollar. That's one of the ways the dollar will be devaluated. By the way, the Chinese have demanded that the Americans come up with a new dollar and devaluate it by 50%. And the U.S. said that's pretty steep and sudden and would cause too much disruption. So instead, the compromise was done that there will be a new dollar. And when push comes to shove, it will be devaluated in two steps, 30% each. Now, flip it to do the math and, and to, for deeper understanding of purchase power, etc. A 30% devaluation means... It's got 70% of its purchase power. You do it twice, and you got 49%. There's your 50. So we're, we're going to see gold, I think, do the heavy lifting between nations, and we're going to see silver do the heavy lifting at the commercial and retail street level. I like to have a, you know, it's, it's, it's not exactly a joke. It's just a, a method of understanding. Gold will be used to buy a house or a building or a farm, a business, or maybe even a big, big car. But silver will be used to buy gasoline, groceries, pay the rent, and pay off small debts. So gold, think macro. Silver, think micro. That's, that's my view. All right. So getting back to uh, the conversion of gold bullion by the Eastern nations, you've said that this will actually it'll be seen as a declaration of financial war. How do you see the U.S. government will respond to this? The U.S. government response has been beyond ugly for a couple of years in this direction. The U.S. government and its Wall Street masters have been trying to steal large Asian hordes of gold. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. That's it for part one. Click here for part two. We're way past the point here now where the dollar even has a chance to survive. We're, we're way past that. Well, one of the things that you said um, in a recent article that's going on right now is that the U.S. Fed is actually using Belgium, Luxembourg, Ireland, the Cayman Islands, and Switzerland to export QE. And it was kind of funny you called these the BLICS nations in contrast to the BRICS nations. Did you want to discuss the role of these BLICS nations, as you call them? And also, you talked about how the Fed is using them to export probably over a trillion dollars of QE per quarter. Did you want to discuss a little bit about this? I said way back in 2000 and. 12 when they began QE that it would go on forever. I called it QE to infinity when they announced QE2 and and when the uh, the taper talk taper talk occurred in in 2013 in other words cutting back on the QE volume I call that a bunch of nonsense a bunch of lies and in the trial balloon. <clears throat> well that failed so it was pretty clear that uh, QE to infinity was the rule. Now what we've got is QE being exported. Uh, these are secondary nations. Belgium is, is the home of some of the Euro Central Bank offices, but it's also the main center for European Union. Uh, they've, they've got a clearinghouse there, a gigantic one for, for European trade, uh, financial you know, clearing. And uh, it's where the European Union Parliament is. Luxembourg has always been a, uh, a financial center in Europe. It's kind of like a, an offshore interior nation to Europe. 
Uh, Ireland is a bit of a surprise. Cayman Islands is, is not a surprise. That's basically the Bank of England. Um, they use a number of nations in the Caribbean on a regular basis to hide their treasury bond purchases, namely Bermuda, Bahamas, and Cayman. And Switzerland is the, the largest of these nations. So you've got the BLICs, and they have significant volume for their treasury purchases. Uh, since June of 2011, half that year, all of 12, all 13, all of 14, that's three and a half years, these BLIC, pardon me, these BLICS nations have purchased $818 billion worth of treasury bonds. It almost matches what the Fed has purchased or what they admit to purchasing. It doesn't count what Wall Street purchases as part of their carry trade. They're not in the business of uh, really investing in capital formation for U.S. businesses anymore. They're in the business of running carry trades, of borrowing free money and buying treasury bonds and putting leverage on it and uh, with the futures and, and making a lot of money without doing any work. Uh, and, and with a wink and a nod that rates will not ever rise so that the, bar, the borrowed money never backfires on them. So we've got enormous volume. Uh, and at the same time, as we have these hidden channels where basically the Fed has exported QE. What they're trying to do, Eli, they're trying to, they're trying to have the entire uh, system, the, the Western financial system, they're trying to get it to endorse and integrate QE. So it's not just the Fed. It's the top layer of the Fed, Bank of England, Euro Central Bank, and the Bank of Japan. Okay. So that's the top layer. Now we've got a secondary layer that's engaged in a tremendous amount of treasury bond purchases, and they are the BLICs. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if uh, they co their coverage of damage, and this is a Wall Street backdoor bailout covering the Wall Street toxic portfolio. They run the U.S. government. Their master is the Fed, so their master is covering their minion Wall Street bank portfolios with, for their toxic treasury bonds. But I wouldn't be at all surprised, given that we had a dismantling of the petrodollar, uh, all those derivatives. And, and, you know, people get confused a little bit by derivative. What's a petrodollar derivative? Well, it's a contract, a futures contract, exotic contract, all kind of different types of contracts that link the major currencies, the forex currencies, like the dollar, the euro, the pound, the Swiss franc, etc., that link them to the crude oil price. Well, it's all being dismantled. That's why the crude oil price went down. The dismantling of the petrodollar system. And I don't believe for a minute that J.P. Morgan only lost $8 billion with the London whale back in May of 2012. I think it's much more like, like over $100 billion, And that's why some of the dead bankers are from the Morgan Stanley offices. They're bankers who wanted to come forward. So instead of coming forward, they went for flying lessons without any kind of equipment. And they splattered, not only on sidewalks, they splattered on, say, the fifth floor roof pavilion of a conference center or whatever. And the dead body didn't have to be cleaned up so quickly because it's on the fifth floor roof. So I, I believe we've got maybe as much as... 200 billion, 300 billion dollars a month being covered by the Fed and, and all of their extensions. The first layer of those major central banks and the BLICs. So that's what I think is going on. Th this is now a new phase where we're, we're not caught in QE to infinity. We're caught in QE to infinity being exported and integrated globally. All right, so I wanted to discuss now about the U.S. Treasury bond market. You recently discussed in an article that um, the U.S. Treasury bond market is actually at extremely low volume right now. What do you see lies ahead for the U.S. Treasury bonds? Yes, uh, it's interesting that the Treasury bond market is really undergoing seizures, and the symptoms are numerous. They, they come in a, a few rather marked ways right now. But the first thing that comes out and, and strikes any observer who's an expert 
in any way, shape, or form in the bond market is that the, the volume is way down. I, I've read reports that the volume compared to, say, two years ago, and two years ago, we were, you know, in, in QE also. It was, that was QE2 and Operation Twist ending and QE2 coming into place and, uh, or the other way around and, and QE3 being planned. Anyway, we were deep into QE uh, two years ago, but the volume is down something like 50 or 60 percent. And, and the indications we're hear, hearing from various bond analysts and bank analysts is that the, the system is more sensitive now. If there's a bunch of selling, the movement's bigger. The volatility is mo- for movement is, is bigger. So the, the whole system is, is more sensitive to shocks because of the lower volume and, and the boast that you've heard for an entire generation that the treasury bond market is the largest and most liquid in the world. That ain't true anymore. Not at all. But here's some of the weird indications and symptoms that something's very wrong. We have negative interest rates. What the heck is that all about? Well, I'll give you a couple of indications. I, I like looking at things from a macro point of view. And, and my macro view is different from uh, a, a lot of different analysts out there. But QE it has destroyed capital. By printing money and not sterilizing, which means removing money elsewhere, by just printing money and infusing it. Hey everyone, this is Elijah Johnson with FinanceAndLiberty.com. And back with us today is Dr. Jim Willie, editor of the Hattrick Letter found on GoldenJackass.com. Jim, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, it's a pleasure being back. I think it's been about a month. And uh, as usual, we have more significant events and what I can actually describe now as, as the billboard marquee message is that the breakdown of the global financial system is in progress and unstoppable to remove the dollar from its global reserve status among the banking centers of the world, banking systems of the world, and reimpose gold as the rule. And I think it's going to come in the form of gold for trade, followed by gold and currencies in the banking system. So we've got some unstoppable processes here underway, Elijah, and, and it's it's full of intrigue, but we're way past the point where the United States leaders, whether they're in Washington or in Wall Street, we're way past the point where they can interrupt or halt any of the developments going on. We, we now have uh, significant mo- momentum for removing the dollar and putting gold in its place. And I believe the Chinese RMB is going to act as an intermediary vehicle between the dollar and gold. So we'll have gold and, I'm sorry, we'll have dollar and, and RMB, you know, RMB, Chinese yuan. We'll have dollar and, and M- RMB rule the day for trade settlement uh, as interim. And then we'll go to gold trade notes and then later we'll, we'll go to a, a more formal gold system in the banks with gold trade notes for letters of credit, etc. We're, we're hey everyone, this is Elijah Johnson with FinanceAndLiberty.com. And back with us today is Dr. Jim Willie, editor of The Hattrick Letter found on GoldenJackass.com. Jim, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, it's a pleasure being back. I think it's been about a month and... Uh, As usual, we have more significant events, and what I can actually describe now as as the billboard marquee message is that the breakdown of the global financial system is in progress and unstoppable to remove the dollar from its global reserve status among the banking centers of the world, banking systems of the world, and reimpose Gold as the rule, and I think it's going to come in the form of gold for trade, 
followed by gold and currencies in the banking system. So we've got some unstoppable processes here underway, Elijah, and, and it's, it's full of intrigue. But we're way past the point where the United States leaders, whether they're in Washington or in Wall Street, we're way past the point where they can interrupt or halt any of the developments going on. We, we now have uh, significant mo momentum for removing the dollar and putting gold in its place. And I believe the Chinese RMB is going to act as an intermediary vehicle between the dollar and gold. So we'll have gold and, I'm sorry, we'll have dollar and, and RMB, you know, renminbi, Chinese yuan. We'll have dollar and, and M RMB rule the day for trade settlement uh, as interim, and then we'll go to gold trade notes, and then later we'll, we'll go to a, a more formal gold system in the bank's with gold trade notes for letters of credit, et cetera. We're, we're way past the point here now where the dollar even has a chance to survive. We're, we're reports that the volume compared to, say, two years ago, and two years ago we were, you know, in, in QE also. It was, that was QE2 and Operation Twist ending and QE2 coming into place and uh, or the other way around. And... And QE3 being planned. Anyway, we were deep into QE uh, two years ago, but the volume is down something like 50 or 60 percent. And, and the indications we're hear, hearing from various bond analysts and bank analysts is that the, the system is more sensitive now. If there's a bunch of selling, the movement's bigger. The volatility is mo for movement is, is bigger. So... The whole system is, is more sensitive to shocks because of the lower volume and, and the boast that you've heard for an entire generation that the treasury bond market is the largest and most liquid in the world. That ain't true anymore. Not at all. But here are some of the weird indications and symptoms that something's very wrong. We have negative interest rates. What the heck is that all about? Well, I'll give you a couple of indications. I, I like looking at things from a macro point of view. And, and my macro view is different from uh, a, a lot of different analysts out there. But QE it has destroyed capital. By printing money and not sterilizing, which means removing money elsewhere, by just printing money and infusing it into the system, and bailing out the Wall Street banks with this backdoor purchases of, of their toxic bonds and putting it on the Fed balance sheet, it causes a reaction in the world. And the, the reaction is, is kind of simple. They, they, the big players look to hedge by buying hard assets as protection. Well, if, if all this money is being ruined, let's find something real. And the real things are like, you know, energy deposits, metal mines, and property building way past that well one of the things that you said um in a recent article that's going on right now is that the u.s fed is actually using belgium luxembourg ireland the cayman islands and switzerland to export qe and it was kind of funny you called these the blix nations in contrast to the BRICS nations did you want to discuss the role of these blix nations as you call them and also you talked about how the fed is using them to export probably over a trillion dollars of QE per quarter. Did you want to discuss a little bit about this? I said way back in 2012 when they began QE that it would go on forever. I called it QE to infinity when they announced QE2. And, and when the, uh, the taper, talk, taper talk occurred in, in 2013, in other words, cutting back on the QE volume, I call that a bunch of nonsense, a bunch of lies, and, and a trial balloon. <clears throat> well, that failed, so it was pretty clear that uh, QE to infinity was the rule. Now what we've got is QE being exported. Uh, these are secondary nations. Belgium is, is the home of some of the Euro Central Bank offices, but it's also the main center for European Union. Uh, they've, they've got a clearinghouse there, a gigantic one for, for European trade, 
uh, financial you know, clearing, and uh, it's where the European Union Parliament is. Luxembourg has always been a, uh, a financial center in Europe. It's kind of like a, an offshore interior nation to Europe. Uh, Ireland is a bit of a surprise. Cayman Islands is, is not a surprise. That's basically the Bank of England. Um, they use a number of nations in the Caribbean on a regular basis to hide their treasury bond purchases, namely Bermuda, Bahamas, and Cayman. And Switzerland is the, the largest of these nations. So you've got the BLICs, and they have significant volume for their treasury purchases. Uh, since... June of 2011, half that year, all of 12, all 13, all of 14, that's three and a half years, these BLIC, pardon me, these BLICS nations have purchased $818 billion worth of treasury bonds. It almost matches what the Fed has purchased or what they admit to purchasing. That doesn't count what Wall Street purchases as part of their carry trade. They're not in the business of... Uh, really investing in capital formation for U.S. businesses anymore. They're in the business of running carry trades, of borrowing free money and buying treasury bonds and putting leverage on it and uh, with the futures and, and making a lot of money without doing any work. Uh, and, and with a wink and a nod that rates will not ever rise so that the, bar, the borrowed money never backfires on them. So we've got enormous volume. Uh, and at the same time, as we have these hidden channels where basically the Fed has exported QE. What they're trying to do, Eli, they're trying to, they're trying to have the entire uh, system, the, the Western financial system, they're trying to get it to endorse and integrate QE. So it's not just the Fed. It's the top layer of the Fed, Bank of England, Euro Central Bank, and the Bank of Japan. Okay. So that's the top layer. Now we've got a secondary layer that's engaged in a tremendous amount of treasury bond purchases, and they are the BLICs. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if uh, they cut their coverage of damage. I mean, this is a Wall Street backdoor bailout covering the Wall Street toxic portfolio. They run the U.S. government. Their master is the Fed, so their master is covering their minion Wall Street bank portfolios with, for their toxic treasury bonds. But I wouldn't be at all surprised, given that we had a dismantling of the petrodollar, uh, all those derivatives. And, and, you know, people get confused a little bit by derivative. What's a petrodollar derivative? Well, it's a contract, a futures contract, exotic contract, all kinds of different types of contracts that link the major currencies, the forex currencies, like the dollar, the euro, the pound, the Swiss franc, etc., that link them to the crude oil price. Well, it's all being dismantled. That's why the crude oil price went down. The dismantling of the petrodollar system. And I don't believe for a minute that J.P. Morgan only lost $8 billion with the London whale back in May of 2012. I think it's much more like, like over $100 billion, And that's why some of the dead bankers are from the Morgan Stanley offices. They're bankers who wanted to come forward. So instead of coming forward, they went for flying lessons without any kind of equipment. And they splattered, not only on sidewalks, they splattered on, say, the fifth floor roof pavilion of a conference center or whatever. And the dead body didn't have to be cleaned up so quickly because it's on the fifth floor roof. So I, I believe we've got maybe as much as... 200 billion, 300 billion dollars a month being covered by the Fed and, and all of their extensions, the first layer of those major central banks and the BLICs. So that's what I think is going on. Th this is now a new phase where we're, we're not caught in QE to infinity. We're caught in QE to infinity being exported and integrated globally. All right, so I wanted to discuss now about the U.S. Treasury bond market. You recently discussed in an article that um, the U.S. Treasury bond market is actually at extremely low volume right now. What do you see lies ahead for the U.S. Treasury bonds? Yes, uh, it's interesting that the Treasury bond market is really undergoing seizures. 
and the symptoms are numerous. They, they come in a, a few rather marked ways right now, but the first thing that comes out and, and strikes any observer who's an expert in any way, shape, or form in the bond market is that the, the volume is way down. I, I've read 